Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. So welcome back to the last lecture of this uh, finite volume series and where we will continue our discussion where we left in the last lecture. Now grid generation if you recall you can actually all your realistic complex grid would be in this nature. When you have a complex grid this kind of a nature either you have option of generating unstructured grid that is one option or you can generate a structured grid structured grid then you need to transform this kind of system to a xi eta system or the regular coordinate system and how you do that you have this kind of a physical domain and this is what it transformed to computational domain and the way it is done it essentially goes to a uniform xi eta direction and as it can be xi xy and eta this would be xy. So, your del del x would be xi x del del xi plus eta x would be del del eta and similarly del del y would be xi y del del xi plus eta y del del eta. And once you transform them then you end up getting a Jacobian of Jacobian of transformation. So, this we have actually discussed when we are talking about grid generation and the transformation or rather talking of the PDEs from there. So, this is how one can do. Now, typical grid generation technique if it is a structured system then either one can use some kind of a algebraic grid generation technique which can take care of these different uh, calculations algebraically and then generate the grid or one can solve for the PDE techniques. PDE means you solve for the uh, partial differential equation and then get the or elliptical grid generator that means you solve for some elliptical PDEs. So, these are the different standard available techniques what one can use and once you and these days there are lot of commercial softwares which are available which is dedicated for the grid generation. And as per your requirement of your code you can generate the grid either one of this technique which is adopted. But it is very important to know how those commercial packages actually works. They behind their grid generating software or the their graphical user interface they actually solve either of this kind of technique whether it is a algebraic fit or partial differential equation kind of thing or elliptic. Now, the same scenario gets changed when you go down to unstructured grid. Here unstructured grid as we have seen throughout this lecture series what kind of element it requires. So, one very common approach is that use domain nodalization approach that means you pick a node then calculate the distance and there is a algorithm which is associated with that or you can do a some triangulation kind of approach and that means you generate some triangular element or do some triangulation and look at the area and then try to generate the grid. So, again your grid generation software when you try to generate unstructured grid it does or takes care one of this algorithm and try to do that. So, the details of that if you are interested you look at any textbook where which is very much dedicated from the grid generation and then find out this. But you have to note that you cannot avoid grid generation when you are talking about CFD calculation because end of the day your CFD calculation needs a grid which will be the representation of your physical domain. Now moving ahead most of our practical problems are turbulence in nature and what happened turbulence in nature uh, field that turbulence fields are not like your laminar flow field. So, you have different kind of scales if you look at your instantaneous flow field which is shown here which essentially 
is a like of chaotic in nature. Turbulence in one word you can say that the chaoticness of the fluid particle. Now, there is a different approaches to model the turbulent flow field. One approach is that you have all sort of small scale which is direct numerical simulation which solve all that details. Details means it means all the scale or intermediate between DNS and uh, DNS and other case you could have Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation which can solve we will see how the Reynolds equations are obtained solve all the mean quantities and in between that you have LES which solve for the large structures. So, that is how, but theoretically this is how your instantaneous flow field looks like. Now, in a LES you actually do some sort of a filtering in physical space and once you do the filtering this gets you back the fluctuating component and instantaneous component which is subtracted from the average quantity. Now, if you look at the scales, this is at the two different Reynolds number. This is Reynolds number 1 which is smaller and this is at the double of that. You look at that, that structures. So, this is a macro structure which are look similar. That means, this structure we are talking. So, they look quite similar in both the situation, but at the high Reynolds number, the you have large la range scale. So, increase in the small range microstructure. That means, we are talking about this structure. These are the microstructures and turbulent flow field is kind of is a mixture of this macro and micro structure or built in that. So, how the energy goes from 1 to n. So, whatever field is there these are these structures are called eddies or vorticities and these eddies are of different sizes. Now, that depends what is the maximum characteristics length of a eddy. This is possible or can be defined based on your geometry. Because if you have a channel, the characteristics length or which is the maximum possible size of the eddy would be the channel diameter. So, what you define? One is length scale L, velocity scale U L, time scale and the Reynolds number. So, turbulent kinetic energy is essentially produced at the macro structure, then it breaks up to the smaller eddies and then smaller eddy to smaller eddy and finally, it dissipates. So, the energy cascading process is like this from large structure. So, this is the large structure or large eddies to go down to the smaller eddies and smaller eddies from there through viscous dissipation it actually dissipates. So, this is the energy cascading process from the large scale to small scale. Now, once you say that what is the primary mechanism? the primary mechanism lies behind this energy cascading process is, is the vortex stretching mechanism, which is essentially talking about you think about a closed vortex tube like this, which is shown here. And then you have a small vortex which is level W 1 and which is stretched at this condition and then this loses. So, total velocity which is given is u 1 plus u 2 and the kinetic energy is estimated at half rho u 1 square plus u 2 square. So, the energy conversion is that small eddies from this large to this, this gains the energy and this loses the energy. So, it is essentially the vortex stretching mechanism from this to this the energy cascades. So, once it happens the smaller one actually gains the energy and larger one actually loses the energy. So, one can think about it is like a vortex street. So, many parallel small vortex tubes like that and now see flow is invisibly unstable because of the vortex sheet rolls up. Now, once that rolls up it generates a new vortex sheets and from this process continues and this generation of smaller and smaller scales. So, that is how from larger scale to smaller scale this process repeats and it generates the different scale of vorticity. Now, if you need to scale this energy and the macrostructure rate. So, here the picture shows how the large scale eddies are formed. So, 
this is the width of the mixing layer, u is the velocity, then the macro structure the length scale would be the characteristics length scale. As one can think if you have a channel, then this could be the order of the uh, diameter of the channel and the velocity at the inlet. Now, the energy of the large scales are order of u naught square, time scale of the larger is L naught by u naught and energy transfer rate is u naught cube by L naught. Now, the viscous dissipation rate at small scale must be of the same order energy transfer rate at the large scale. That is how the energy balance is maintained and epsilon is can be estimated which is known as the energy dissipation or kinetic energy dissipation that can be estimated like this. So, what shows that it could be of this kind of. Now, if you scale down the small scale of the microstructure, then the dynamics of the small scale in turbulence are pretty much dominated by the viscous dissipation. So, your kinematic viscosity and epsilon come into the picture and the smallest scales are we are termed as the Kolmogorov scales because Kolmogorov provided that hypothesis. So, their length scale would be of which we say eta which is estimated as nu cube by epsilon to the power 1 by 4 u eta that is the velocity and time scale and the Reynolds number at the eta scale is eta u eta by nu. So, and the ratio of Kolmogorov scale to the macro structure if you one has to find out one can find out this length eta by L naught is R e naught to the power minus 3 by 4, u eta by u naught is R e naught to the power minus 1 by 4, tau eta by tau naught is this. So, increase in the range of scale as with increasing R e. So, if you have a higher Reynolds number case your scales become smaller and that is what you need to essentially your computational grid needs to take care of that small scale. Now, this if you put together in a nicely picture, this is how the energy cascading actually takes place. This is the characteristics length scale and then you have a energy containing range or this is your macro structure where all the kinetic energy is produced. Then from there you come this is called the inertial sub range where the energy trans, uh, process follows and you finally get this length scale and it comes down to the dissipation change. So, the between dissipation and inertial there is a demarcation line and this is between inertial and energy there is a demarcation line and these are the microstructure or universal equilibrium structure and this goes through the dissipation. So, one hand there is a production energy transfer takes place to the smaller one and then it goes up. So, that is how from small scale to large scale the energy transfer process takes place. Now, if you scale that one scale scale the inertial range in the like this and you can characterize these things. Now, Kolmogorov provided this theory that three hypotheses one is that local isotropic of the microstructure then the statistics of the microstructure have a universal form. So, that is why the scales in the dissipation range are quickly determined. So, any textbook on turbulence you will find these details, these are nothing new just to give you an idea how turbulence happens before you. So, how one can actually describe either it has to be described statistically the Reynolds propose some decomposition of the mean flow field you have a instantaneous flow field. So, you can decompose on the mean and fluctuating component. So, which will actually lead to the Rand's equation or Reynolds average equation we can see that how it is done and then you get some turbulence model to close that down. So, this is how your small scales are defined and this is your instantaneous flow field. So, Reynolds averaging says any flow variable would be one mean and fluctuating component and if you do time averaging this is time averaging this is how you evaluate that. So, this is the Reynolds decomposition. Then you also can do like special averaging. 
So, this is called it is a different ways one can define the averaging and then other way one can do ensemble averaging this is called ensemble averaging that means you collect the sample multiple times and divide by that that gives you uh, there are certain averaging rules for the runs one is that if you take the average of the fluctuating component that is zero double bar of that that same if you take the delta phi of the average it's delta phi bar phi plus phi bar it's like that so these are the certain reynolds averaging rules which follows this so once you try to derive your rand's equation so that means you have a flow field which will be average plus fluctuating pressure is p plus p prime temperature is t prime time prime and these are all component if you put these things back in your continuity momentum equation and energy equation your continuity equation looks like this this is your continuity this is your momentum equation so all the variables like pressure velocity temperature again this is what we are writing for incompressible cases because the density variation is not taken into consideration and this is my energy equation and after applying those law the reynolds average form of the equation will look like this which will only solve for the average quantity or rather mean quantity so it solve for or mean profiles and the term which will appear there is a reynolds trace term in the momentum equation which is a tensor 3 by 3 matrix and same thing in the energy flux which will be a cross term of the u prime t prime v prime t prime and w prime t prime now one important hypothesis which is used is the buzi nesk hypothesis to close this terms so this reynolds stress term is correlated like turbulent viscosity and molecular viscosity and your kinetic energy is computed like this and at the same time your pressure reynolds stress is usually combined with the pressure gradient term so the turbulent pressure would be like this and your thermal fluxes are calculated like that so this reynolds stress term is become an quantity which can be correlated with the mu t and this mu t is the term which is called the turbulent eddy viscosity so this turbulent eddy viscosity now everything boils down to the system if you look at the system here it will be a diffusion term which will have some effective viscosity mu plus mu t that means that this is your effective viscosity in your momentum equation similarly in your thermal equation there will be make effective conductivity now how to calculate this so that gives rise to a different kind of turbulence model and if you have mu t it is estimated like this and one can have algebraic turbulence model one can have one equation model one can have two equation model and then one can have second order closer model so there are different kind of rand's model one can see so if you look at the complete picture of the rand's equations so there will be continuity equation momentum equation energy equation now this is kinetic energy equation which you can see there is a effective viscosity epsilon equation which is k equation kinetic energy epsilon equation and turbulent frequency omega so these are the set of equations and once you discretize them in your finite volume this is exactly what you k get for the this is for turbulent kinetic energy so again the equation looks same here the coefficients for kinetic energy would be mu effective ef by this this is the ac then time transient term so these are all coefficients which you get for the k equation now similarly one will get an equation for epsilon this is epsilon equation and accordingly 
your coefficients will be modified as per the epsilon equation. This is your AF, AC, AC previous time step and B source term. So, this will return all the or one can think about the omega equation 2. So, all these equations will appear there. Now, one important thing it will happen is that calculation of the wall function because all these turbulent equations these are having used and that time and the thing is that near the wall flow field resolution is very important if you have a domination of the viscosity. So, to resolve that one has to typically there are three different layers where the uh, layers can be divided one is called the viscous sub layer and where your distance or the your uh, normal distance is defined d plus less than 5 then your buffer layer buffer layer where d plus lies between 30 to 5 and then inertial sub layer. So, where d plus lies between 200 to 30 and d plus is estimated like that d perpendicular distance by u tau by nu which is y plus and u tau is nothing but tau at the wall by density and d is the normal distance to the wall. So, that is how you can calculate. Now, if you go to so, the sub layer then this is how u plus and y plus they are connected and if you have a moving wall then u plus is connected like that this cast sub layer and for k and epsilon typically this is what done k or omega. So, for two equation models this is how it is done. Now, one can see when it comes down to a boundary element this is a boundary element and I mean where close to the wall and you have to boundary element at wall because the normal calculation needs to be done. So, one can calculate the normal distance dc plus like dc u tau by nu and kinetic energy like that. So, which will get you back dc like c mu k c and c mu k c. So, as long as dc perpendicular less than d limiting plus the point lies in the viscous sub layer otherwise it will be in the inertial sub layer. Similarly, this is the turbulence production term and this is the dissipation term which can be estimated at that cell and this is the turbulent frequency term and one can estimate the wall shear stress also. So, once you estimate all these I mean these are the calculation for that and one can actually get all this calculation for at wall this information can be calculated. Now, the other way one can think about using some sort of an improved wall function because what happens that sometimes the grid resolution is not sufficient. So, one may use the improved wall function and you can actually derive these equations for improved wall function or thirdly one can think about some scalable wall function. Essentially what you do you need to calculate the normal distance and once you calculate the normal distance to the wall then you can solve for it. Now, how do you calculate the normal distance that is the critical part. Let us see a two dimensional control volume or two dimensional control volume. How do you calculate the normal distance? So, the normal distance can be calculated is just using some sort of an uh, based on solving a differential equation. So, this can be calculated by solving a differential equation and which could be solving a like an poison econal or Hamilton Jacobi kind of equation. 
So, if you look at the Poisson equation del 2 phi equals to minus 1, then which will be boundary condition? It is on wall and del phi dot n equals to 0 elsewhere. So, the normal distance can be calculated equals to minus del phi magnitude of that plus del phi square plus 2 phi, which is minus square root of del phi by del x plus uh, square plus del phi by del y square plus del phi by del z square plus square root of del phi by del x square del phi by del y square and del phi by del z square plus 2 phi. So, and if you solve the turbulent flow problem and use everything in the uh, in your uh, governing equations, you get this geometric diffusion coefficient, geometric diffusion coefficients at the face is E f by D C f and your discretized equation would get modified like A c phi c plus face n b c a f phi f equals to b c. Here a f equals to minus g uh, f which we got here, then a c equals to minus summation over f g f and b c equals to b c plus f which is del phi f dot t f. So, that is how you can calculate the normal distance. So, essentially that talks about how you implement all these things in your system of equation and if you that also brings down to the to some extent the closure of these lectures and what we have actually talked the our numerical scheme based on finite volume method and then we talked about the classifications of the PDEs and all these things. Initially for the finite volume method the prime objective of any CFD is that you have a physical problem. So, that transform to a discretized equation applying this finite volume discretized equation, discretized equation which will nothing but a linear system f e equals to b then apply a linear solver which actually get you a solution and that solution should be representing to physical problem. So, the global picture what we started off if you close it down you have a physical problem of interest in hand you apply your numerical technique the one which we have discussed here is the finite volume you get a discretized equation that is essentially leading to a linear so system and then we discussed all different kind of linear solver like uh, iterative solver, direct solver and which will get you the solution. Now, the physical problem which is governed by this PDEs, they are actually then the PDEs are essentially uh, we talked about all different kind of discussion where diffusion separately convection separately, transient separately and we have taken care of everything together when we combined everything back to the Navier-Stokes equation for fluid flow solver. And when you go down to the fluid flow solver, we have actually used our uh, incompressible solver, then we talked about the pressure velocity coupling and the interpolation, then finally talking about simple and simple family based algorithm. Then we move to the compressible where again we discussed about the discretization and boundary condition and finally we touched upon the grid generation and the turbulence modeling and that concludes the discussion on finite volume and I hope it will be helpful to get started with finite volume method. Thank you.